And we are back. Welcome to the Mercy Cast, where we are learning the art of compassion through the adversity of life. I am your host, Raleigh Sadler. We talk about brokenness on this podcast because we truly believe that we are not on the last page of our book. We believe that there is hope. We believe that even the hard things that we go through transform us. Today, I want to talk about sexual brokenness. This is something that all of us face. Each of our experience of sexual brokenness can look different. It can come from a variety of factors, but no matter who we are, if we are breathing, we are impacted by it. In graduate school, earning his master's in counseling psychology and a master's of divinity, Jay was immersed in a disordered eating and porn use. He felt immense self-hatred, questioned whether he should be going into both the therapy and the ministry profession. He learned to see these symptoms less as indictments and more as clues. I'm joined by Jay Stringer. He's the author of Unwanted. Jay, welcome to the Mercy Cat. Raleigh, thank you so much for having me on. It's an honor to be here today. So you're going through this experience where you've, in a sense, got one job. You're trying to be a counselor as well as a minister but you're struggling with these things that seem to contradict your calling. How did you shift from seeing these as indictments to seeing it more as clues? Yeah, Um, I, I think part of the benefit of the seminary that I went to was that they required masters of counseling students and I believe MDiv students to go through 40 hours of therapy with a licensed therapist. So I am, just forever grateful that the graduate school and people who founded it had enough wisdom to really invite leaders to do their own work. Uh, There was a big adage at the grad school that I went to that said, paraphrasing from Carl Jung, but essentially no leader can take anyone further than he or she has been himself or herself. And so kind of embedded within that school was you've got to do some of your own work. And I think the dilemma for me was that I grew up in a pastor's family. And so I had kind of learned how to two-step dance between some level of faithfulness, learning to manage my appearance, learning to kind of present in a way that was, I would say, both authentic, but also I knew how to play the game. And then there was the sense of most of the difficulties in my life, I felt like I needed to hide. And so I was doing that the first year or two that I was in grad school. And it was in the middle of my own therapy work that I essentially just started talking about some of the specifics of what I had felt immense levels of shame about. And definitely disordered eating and porn use was a big part of that. And the therapist that I was working with uh, didn't let me just kind of stay in vague generalities, but began to ask me about some of the specifics of what disordered eating looked like for me. Like what food choices was I pursuing? And then what porn choices was I pursuing? And that was kind of the first sense of just some of those questions of feeling like there is someone that is not just trying to indict me, but is really trying to invite me to be curious about why I'm drawn to the foods, to the porn that I was drawn to. So I can unpack that more, but that was, yeah, that season of beginning to see that I felt so indicted by my behavior and therefore felt a lot of shame, desire to hide. But then I began to kind of see that these things are clues into the unaddressed and therefore unresolved portions of my life. And so when this person is talking to you about your disordered eating and your use of porn, get you to kind of go deeper into that, into the why, and try to listen to yourself for understanding. Yes, so, it, yeah, one of, it, again, most of what I would say is we, we don't change in abstraction. We change when we can name some of the specifics of what we are dealing with. And so for me, one of the things that I felt like I was, you know, overindulging on, this sounds funny looking back on it, was apple fritters. There was a friend of mine who worked the closing shift at our local Starbucks, and he... It, 
basically could bring home free day old pastries. And so a couple days a week after he would finish the shift, we would just be, you know, just surrounded by apple fritters, cake pops, all the sandwiches that we could want. And as, you know, people on a grad school budget, this was like manna coming into the home. And what I remember doing was just eating a lot of those apple fritters. I'd put them in the microwave. We also had a bunch of white chocolate sauce, chocolate sauces, and I would just kind of drizzle this apple fritter in just a lot of calories. And it was delicious. It was good. But then I would begin to feel just immense levels of shame about my belly. And then you know, this is often the case with unwanted behaviors of any kind is that the more you feel disgust and self-hatred, the more you need something else to be able to mitigate some of those terrible feelings. And that was kind of quickly the function of porn is that I would kind of move from one area of shame to another area of dissociation to distance myself from food shame and then involve myself in porn searches. And so when I was beginning to kind of look back into this notion that even my eating of pastries has a story, some of the stories that began to come up for me was that in middle school, my nickname was Donut. And so I showed up to middle school uh, with a white striped shirt when I was at probably seventh or eighth grade. And this jelly donut dripped down from my donut onto my white shirt. And that kind of became the start of Doughboy for Jay Stringer. And so people used to put their index finger into my belly and just that sense of like the, if you remember the Pillsbury Doughboy commercials, the people would just put their index finger into my belly. And that would be just a lot of my middle school experience. Then I'd get home from that and pretty disconnected, emotionally disconnected home that I lived in. And so I remember just eating a lot of brownies, a lot of pastries in the evening to, you know, in some ways soothe and dissociate from some of the bullying that I was experiencing in middle school. And so that was, you know, Raleigh, one of the first times that I began to bridge some of my grad school behaviors with some of the unaddressed stories of my life. And so it wasn't that my disordered eating and bulimia was trying to indict me for being a hypocrite. I mean, I can understand the reading of that, but far more, it was providing a clue into a story of mine that had never been addressed, that had never been healed. And so I think that was the season where there was just a tremendous amount of, I need to be curious about what I have labeled as broken and pathological because embedded within the brokenness itself are clues to the healing that we seek. I've often been asked by coaches and mentors, mm-hmm. like if I'm struggling with something, whatever it is, and I talk to someone about it and I confess it, they, they're like, well, what's the good part about this? And I'm like, there's nothing good. You know, there's <laughs> nothing. nothing good about this. But to realize that there is that clue, it is pointing to something. You said self-hatred led you to porn to kind of help you to feel better. But then, of course, that just led you down the rabbit hole of shame. How are these concepts of disconnection and dissociation connected? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of times, especially in the, the sexual brokenness conversation, we often believe that we go to an unwanted behavior, porn, infidelity, as a coping mechanism. So there's some language of, you know, I'm, I'm going to this because I'm trying to self-medicate or because I have past trauma history. And it's not that that is untrue, it's that it's a partial truth. And so the deeper truth that I would say that people need to engage is you don't just go to an unwanted behavior to find self-soothing. You also go to reenact some of the formative beliefs and patterns of your life. And so, you know, if I were to go back to some of my experiences in middle school, there was a lot of self-hatred. There was a lot that kind of said, my desires are disgusting. My desires have led to obesity. My desires have kind of led to things that are hypocritical. And so a lot of times what happens to us is that we go to something to begin to dissociate, to disconnect from the, those harmful realities 
But after we have indulged for the 1000th time, it's not about self-medicating. We already know the end of the story, which is about some level of judgment. And so in my estimation, most unwanted behaviors are not primarily about self-medicating. They are about reinforcing core judgments against someone. And so I think that's, that's a very important category because where I would ground that conversation is to kind of begin thinking about the nature of trauma. And so trauma is, I'm, I'm not going to be able to give a, a full scope of trauma. But whenever there is trauma, let's talk about trauma in terms of three things, the fragmentation, the numbing, and then the eventual isolation. So trauma fragments us, fragments us from ourselves, fragments us from others. When that thing happens, if it's a big T trauma or small T trauma, our reality, our sense of faith in the goodness of God, our sense of faith and trust in our family or in our friends begins to unravel. And within that fragmentation, there is going to be a lot of pain that is experienced. And so when the body is in pain, we do need some level of self-medication. We need some level of dissociation to be able to disconnect from those painful realities. And that's often, you know, whether it's alcohol, drug use, screens, porn, doesn't matter what it is. That's some of the initial numbing from the pain of fragmentation. But the more that you begin to use a particular substance or behavior in that numbing sense, the more isolated you're going to feel. And then in the midst of the isolation, we're going to hear a lot of voices. We're going to kind of make a lot of harsh judgments against ourselves. And so when you have you know, as Brené Brown says, secrecy, silence, and judgment, that is the petri dish of shame. And so what happens at that stage is just a lot of self-hatred, a lot of self-loathing that then gets cemented into someone. So I, I think if we are to address trauma well, we have to look at, you know, those three fold descriptors of trauma to be able to say, like, what have the judgments been? How have I learned how to dissociate and numb? But then also, I, I need to go back to the specific stories that began to fragment me and begin to mitigate my trust in the goodness of life itself. So if one of our listeners is processing their history of porn use, or they are thinking through, maybe they have bought sex or made a decision like that, that anytime we make these decisions they impact us, they impact other people, so they're living with shame. How do they get to a point where they can even accept it rather than deny it and keep going with that negative coping skill? Yeah, and I I think that's where it goes back to the level of curiosity. So when you think about maybe buying sex or a specific porn search that you are pursuing, I would say get to the specifics. So, you know, let's say you're drawn to a particular genre of pornography, like there is a search for term that you are, you know, putting into the internet or you're scrolling to be able to find something specific. Uh, You should ask yourself, like, at what point in my life did I initially become drawn to this? So the analogy that I use in some of my work is to kind of think about your life, your sexual life as a house. And so it's kind of late in the evening and you hear that familiar knock of lust or desire come to your door and just that sense of like, what are you going to do about it? And some people try and put a force field over their home and they try to get internet monitoring. They try and get some level of accountability. They try and keep the unwanted stuff out and that might work for a season, but then inevitably the unwanted behavior comes into their house and they let it ransack various rooms. And so part of my approach is inviting men and women to go out onto the front porch of their sexual life and just begin to ask it questions like, why was I drawn to this behavior? What what is it about sex that I feel like this out of control desire for? Or what is it about sexual desire that is a complete turnoff for me? And I would prefer to not be sexual. And my life would be a lot better if my partner felt that as way as well. So it what we need to do is just to develop a level of curiosity for why we are drawn to what we are drawn to. 
And then inevitably, there are going to be certain clues that begin to surface. So that could be, you know, sometimes that's the introduction to porn uh, or the introduction to buying sex. And so some people might say, yeah, I remember being at a bachelor party or I remember being in college or on a work trip to Tampa and my boss took me to a strip club and that was kind of the first time. Or maybe there was this kid down the street that started showing me porn and then we began to act out some of what was playing out in porn. And that was kind of the first season in my life where sexuality just became deeply troubling and something that I was both drawn to, but also horrified by. And so whenever we get curious, we're going to come up with stories. And those stories are what are most needed to begin to heal and to understand why we do what we do. And so when we go back to kind of where it begins, in a sense, this is kind of our origin story of looking at our brokenness and say, okay, when did, yes. when did I go to this? And it sounds like you are saying, we look at it and as we ask it can maybe not figure out, maybe figure out kind of like why we went to it in the first place and address that, that core need that's behind the behavior. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, the example that I always think about in this realm, Raleigh, is like the, it's been probably a decade or so since the Somali pirates were making a lot of news stories, but just that sense of like, you know, they were hijacking uh, and maybe they're back in the news now that I say that, or maybe it's not Somali, but regardless, the, the sense of like, why were they doing what they were doing? Like, why would these people try and pirate ships and make lots of money outside of just the profits that could be had? Well, when you go back to a, you know, the history of Somalia, you find out that the country had a lot of warlords that were you know, taking over the country. And then we also found that it, I think the United Nations also estimated that people were stealing, other countries were stealing about $300 million worth of fish off of their coast. So Somalia has a couple thousand miles of coastline and it was basically being pillaged. And so you have these fishermen who have toxic chemicals being dumped off of their coast. And then you also have other fishermen from other countries stealing their money, and then a lot of instability in the country. Well, what are you going to do if you have a very fast boat, but no ability to fish and a lot of weapons in your country? It's, it's not rocket science to begin to add those things together. And so that's very similar to what I'm asking people to consider is, you know, if you grew up in a pretty disengaged home, and when you came home from middle school, when you came home from a breakup or something difficult happened, did you have a mother or a father who saw and was attuned to something of your heartache and something of the sadness of your face? And if you did not have that, you know, a 12 year old needs to be able to find some level of self soothing and affect regulation. And so for a lot of times, that becomes the role of porn is that when they begin to, feel some level of pleasure. They see the eyes of an adult in a porn film that actually appears like they want them. That can be a pretty powerful initial experience for a middle schooler who is completely devoid of care and connection. And so that's what I'm saying is, you know, we don't go to the past to make excuses for ourselves, but we do need to be able to go back to understand how did our story take the trajectory that it did? And rather than outsourcing the solution to sexual exploitation, sexual brokenness, infidelity, we need to become the mother or father that we likely did not have, but very much needed. With the use of pornography morphing and changing, people are no longer getting a magazine but they're still looking for that acceptance. And many of them are finding it in, it could Google searches of porn or OnlyFans where there's a faux relationship formed with the person. How do we address that? Yeah, so the, the story that comes to mind, Raleigh, is when I was working in Seattle, uh, the city of Seattle had something called the John School, which was basically a diversion of sentencing for men who had been arrested for soliciting 
women in prostitution. And so I was essentially the sex addiction therapist for the city, and which basically just meant a lot of lecturing around the topic. And then I would see a handful of men that had been arrested throughout the year. And so one of the first men that I worked with, he began to talk to me about, you know, essentially saying, you know, don't get me wrong. I go to sex for the power, for the pleasure of it. But one of my favorite rituals that I do is just to cruise around the streets of Seattle and try and lock eyes with women. And that could be just like random women at the bus stop. That could be women you know, trapped within sexual exploitation. And so we started unpacking just that notion of him cruising around the neighborhood, trying to make eye contact with someone. And I can't remember the exact sequence, but we started talking about middle school for him. And he was a latchkey kid, just would, had a lot of time home alone. And he said that one of his most favorite things growing up was he would ride his Schwinn bicycle all around the streets of the neighborhood. And I said, what did you love about that bike? What did you love about riding it? And he said, I used to cruise around the streets of my neighborhood when I was a kid and just try and lock eyes with girls in my class or their friends' moms. And even as he said it, he wasn't aware of what he was saying, but he essentially used the same language to describe this middle school self to this adult that was using and buying sex. And so that became some of the initial bridge work that we needed to do is to be able to say, how did that kid go from being a latchkey kid, emotionally disengaged and cruising around the streets of his neighborhood? How did that then get funneled into using another person for his own sexual gain. And so that was kind of the dual work that we needed to do is on one hand, we needed to be able to understand how his story got him to that place. But then as he got into his own story and his own grief and some of the ways that his body and his life had been used, that really allowed him to step into integrity with the ways that he was now causing harm to other people within his sexual behavior. But I, I often find that a lot of times people intuitively know that what they're doing is not the best thing. They know that there's some level of exploitation within the work that they're doing, but it's really not until they see their own exploitation, some of their own loss, some of their own heartache that they really begin to step into integrity with what they're doing. So I once heard Tim Keller talk about how a lot of Christianity is people trying to push people to be the good Samaritan. Like we intuitively know we're supposed to be good. We're supposed to do the right thing. But essentially what Tim Keller said is until you realize that you were the person in the road and the good Samaritan has come to you, that's where the heart change comes to be able to go and be the good Samaritan to others. And so that's, that's very similar to the work of healing and therapy. It's, I think when people have not been to therapy, they say like, oh, it's just all blame your parents. It's all blame your past, no accountability. But it's like, no, it's, it's about something of the gospel, which is I have to identify my own brokenness, the places where my family of origin used my gifts and used uh, a lot of my talents and for their own gain. And as I begin to step into how I have been hurt, how I have been used, how I have known alienation and trauma, when that happens, the you know, the the gray matter in our brains begins to change and we can begin to engage empathy, compassion, goodness for others. But oftentimes we try and push people to be good until we recognize or before we recognize some of the heartache in people's lives. It's like we focus more on the behavior rather than what's leading to that behavior. And well said. And yeah. I love how you are advocating, even when we started, you were talking about following the clues versus seeing them as indictments. You know, I talk about this frequently, how we can think in terms of law and gospel. And a lot of times we can just slam ourselves with the law. I like just keep hitting ourselves. And I, th I feel like we need grace and truth. 
You know, we need both of those. But you're advocating for this approach where we look at ourselves through a lens of kindness. We're looking at ourselves and saying, okay, you're doing this. This is not okay. Yeah. But like, let's dig into why. Yeah. And that's the pattern that we see throughout the Old Testament. It's like when when Adam has eaten of the tree that he was commanded not to eat from, God doesn't come in with indictment. God says like, you know, where are you? And to Jacob, who can't figure out his identity or his name, <laughs> the angel of the Lord says, what is your name? And then to Hagar, who has been immensely traumatized by the first family of our faith, the angel of the Lord shows up to her and says, where do you come from and where are you going? And that's what I would propose, that if we are hearing something of the voice of God, it's one that is kind. It's one that is curious. It's one that is drawing us to deeper reflection with regard to how our sorrow or our sin came to be. But oftentimes when we think that we're hearing God's voice, it, it tends to be much more of a projection of our self-loathing, just kind of a sense of, really, you're back at this again. What in the world is wrong with you? And again, very likely that's a projection of your own inner voice and in psychology, what we say is that the way that parents talk to their kids becomes their inner voice. Or you might say the way that the church talks to us becomes something of our inner voice of God. And so for a lot of us, we have to begin to have a healthy interrogation for what voices we are hearing with regard to our broken and unwanted behaviors. I noticed you said the word integrity. Mm -hmm. And you didn't use the word purity. Mm -hmm. And I think for many, we have, especially in an American context, grown up with this idea of a purity culture, which, though potentially well-meaning, can be shame-inducing. You know, I, I met someone once and she said, I lost my true love weights ring and then I ended up having sex. And I'm like, well, I, I don't know if it was the ring's fault. That, that happened. Um, there might have been some other things leading up to that moment. Possibly. That we just were, that you were just unaware of in that moment. But tell me, do you think it's better to use the term integrity, especially in light of our own sexual integrity, than to use the term purity? Because I do. I do find that much more beneficial and generative. So, I mean, from a theological standpoint, I would say that there, like, our efforts to purify ourselves uh, have not gone well <laughs> at any century. And so, according to the gospel, purity has already been applied to my identity, and I have not done anything to accomplish that. That is the gift of justification that I have received from God, is I am pure. I am good. But the word integrity for me has a lot more to do with just a play on that word is integration. And so integration is the ability to piece together the different stories of our lives to be able to tell a pretty coherent story with regard to why we do what we do and to get a sense of where we're going. So when the angel of the Lord shows up to Hagar to say, where have you come from and where are you going? The angel of the Lord is asking for integrity of let's integrate your trauma history of being taken out of Egypt as a teenager, exploited, brought into the first family to be a concubine. So it, when the angel of the Lord shows up, it's tell me about your past, but then also that sense of where do you want to go in the future? And so to me, integrity is not about what we are doing with our genitals. Integrity is about our ability to know our story and to know where we come from and then to be able to co-author with God the future that is to come. And I love this idea of integration because it frees us to see ourselves not wholly as one thing, because I think that's where shame comes in. If you use pornography, or if you look upon someone with lust, or whatever you do that makes you feel shame, raise your voice in a crowded restaurant at your kids, or whatever it is, it's very easy just to see ourselves through that one thing and be like, I'm a terrible person, I'm awful. And then that drives this negative behavior. But as we integrate and we see, well, yeah, that's a part of me. Sometimes I do that. And here's another part of me. And we're all in the car together. And so, it's me driving and then I've got all these other people. 
And I think when you realize that it's a part, but it's not the whole you, then you can at least be, you can be more accepting, but you can also be more aware of who do you let drive the car? Yes. Yeah, there, it, it, most, a lot of the neuroscientists these days, when they are talking about integration, I know parts language, if you're in any psychology spaces, it's kind of like there's a protector part or a, you know, an exile part. And it's not that that language is not accurate, but some of the leading neuroscientists would say that there are actually self states within us. And so, the, you know, the better language would be that there are different ages that are within us. So within me is like that 12 year old, 13 year old boy that was bullied and called donut. Every time I eat a donut, almost every time I eat a donut, there is some level of noise that begins to kind of fill my brain of, should I be eating this? And I have labeled this food as bad rather than really addressing some of my trauma history. So every time I eat a donut, you know, I'm almost 41 years old. So I'm eating it as a 41 year old, but I'm also eating it as that 23 year old in seminary, but I'm also eating it as a 12 year old, but I'm also at some level eating it as a seven-year-old boy that I remember asking for a donut birthday cake because I thought they were the greatest things ever. So all of that is a mashup of, it's not just a part of me likes the donut and a part of me hates the donut. It's that I have ages within me of a seven-year-old boy's delight, a 12-year-old boy's trauma, a 23-year-old young adult's hypocrisy and entitlement. And it's all together. So integrity for me, when I sit down to eat a donut, is to be able to say, there's a lot of people, as you said, Raleigh, in the car with me. So when I sit down, it's not just me eating that donut in New York City. It's There is a host of Jay Stringers that are joining me at the table. And it's my job as the 41-year-old conductor. I know I'm playing with way too many metaphors here, but it's... (laughs) As the 41-year-old conductor to say, seven-year-old boy, you have a tremendous amount to teach me as a 41-year-old, this 23-year-old, and this 12-year-old about what it means to find play and delight with this donut. So lead us into (laughs) this amazing donut experience that we're about to have. And I love that language. I love that language much better because you're able to see yourself as more than who you are right now and to know that that young version of you is still there. That 20-year-old version of you is still there. And to kind of listen to yourself, I've heard people go as far as speaking to the younger version and saying, hey, you were there when our porn use started. Mm -hmm. Why did you go to it? What were you feeling? What were you experiencing? Yeah. But then also, what do you find joy in? And what do you, and like kind of reconnecting with that curiosity and that joy of your youth. And how would you encourage people to start that journey? Because for a lot of people, they don't have either the terminology for this. They've never thought like this. Mm -hmm. They might be nervous that it's hocus pocus, you know? (laughs) Sure. Yeah. Well, I think what you just modeled there, Raleigh, is exactly the work of, You know, when we approach our childhood self, we are coming to that child as the mother, as the father, as the protector that they never receive. And so that's a really important point is that you don't outsource to a therapist. You don't outsource to a spouse, to a partner, a friend, some of these. I mean, I think that's part of a therapist or maybe, you know, clergy's role is to act as a good witness to a lot of the trauma before you can actually become the witness to what you have been through for yourself. But I think that's what we need is we need to be able to go back to that young boy, that young girl, and be able to normalize some level of like, yeah, like you saw porn and it was so arousing and our bodies are made by God to feel that arousal. And so everything that you were experiencing in that arousal and that desire Like that is good. So your desire is not bad. But part of the difficulty is that you didn't have the full scope of what happens within sexual exploitation. You didn't have coping skills. You didn't have the ability to regulate your own affect in the midst of that. So part of what I tell a lot of my clients, and especially those that I do intensives with, is 
you know, you, you found a well in the desert and in some ways, I'm glad that you found a well that helped you to survive. But that well also had some toxins in it that we need to begin to address. And so it's not that we go back to the same well, it's that we need to create new wells and find new ways of relational engagement and then also psychological engagement to be able to find self-soothing in a way that doesn't bring judgment or harm to others. And so that's a lot of the work is, you know, understanding that kid, understanding, blessing the arousal, but then being able to pivot and to be able to say, now that we are an adult, I don't want to keep bringing that childhood self of my porn or sexual exploitation as a means to soothe and as a means to reinforce judgment. Like I, as the good mother, good father, want to bring that kid the experience of play and delight and calm and rest in the midst of all the heartache that they have known. So that's the work. You've got to understand and see yourself with that level of self-compassion. But then you also have to give them something better. Well, and that idea of parenting yourself, that Mm -hmm. idea of diving into your own story and doing the story work, I think that leads us to a place where we can kind of connect with who we are, who we have been. Yes who we're becoming. But in those moments when we're parenting ourselves, we can also redirect. We can Mm -hmm. say, okay, you're about to blow your top. Like it's about to get super awkward at the Arby's. I mean, it's going to get weird. And I don't know if I can, I'm getting flooded right now. I'm just seeing red. Mm -hmm. You're able to take a step back and be like, hey, you're okay. Yes. And you're a good kid. And what you're feeling right now, those are, those are real feelings and that's okay. But that feeling, it lasts 90 seconds. So let's hold. Let's hold and let that emotion pass. And then we'll let go of it. And then we will re-engage. But being able to kind of, and especially with, I mean, I've talked to friends who they would be like, you know what? I felt the temptation to look at porn. And what I did was I called you instead. Mm -hmm. And so can we just talk? Because I just need emotional connection right now. I just need a friend to just chat with. Awesome. Yeah. Wonderful. Jay, in these last moments, how would you encourage our listeners who are thinking about, maybe for the first time ever, thinking about their sexual brokenness and how it's been negatively impacting them? How would you encourage us to connect with our own stories? So a lot of times we think about what it means to be free from sexual brokenness. But when I look at something like you know, Galatians 5, it is for freedom that you have been set free. And so I think the reason why we engage some of our sexual brokenness is not just to be free from sin or free from unwanted behavior, but it's really a sense of what is freedom for. And so the example I use with some of my clients is sometimes when people have been through a lot of addiction treatment or even therapy, they will come to see me for an intensive or for individual work. And they're like, you know, I've been sober for 36 months and I haven't looked at porn in four years or something like that. But then when I'm with them, my experience of them is that they are just like dead inside that. Yes, they have been free from something, but like there's no life in them at all. So it's like they showed me their backyard and they're saying, Jay, there's no weeds back here. And then it's like, yeah, but like your backyard is supposed to be a garden that you can enjoy and experience. And there's supposed to be a lot of life and vitality and there's none of that there. So that's really why we do this work. I mean, there are some things that we need to be able to address, but it's always in the service of joy. And so when someone is you know, saying, should I really take the leap to address my sexual brokenness? Should I really dive into this? On some level, we intuitively know that we should, but we also have to begin to think about what joy am I sacrificing? What delight am I forfeiting through continuing down a way of life that is full of judgment, that's full of secrecy, that's full of shame? And is there something better for me at play? And so I think that's kind of the existential cry of the soul that just says no more. Like, I do not want this thing to steal my joy, my 
my peace, my comfort anymore. I want something better. And so I think that's why we do it is not just to be good Samaritans, not just to be, you know, people of peace on this earth, but far more like it's about abundance. It's about delight. It's about play. Jay, thank you so much for being on the Mercy Cast. This has been great. You've given us so much to think about. Thank you for having me on. Enjoyed the conversation, Raleigh.